Chapter 5 1942 came, but the British didn't, nor did the French. They were too busy fighting the Germans in the West. The radio talked about the fighting in Denmark and Norway and Belgium and the Netherlands, but since it was a German station, they always said they were winning. Uncle Mosh said we wouldn't trust anything we heard, but he listened to every word anyway, just like the rest of us. All I cared about was getting out of our crowded house for some freedom and fresh air, but my parents were still worried I'd be snatched up by the Nazis. The snow was still thick on the ground, with more falling every day. The Jews were put to work, shoveling it off the streets. The Nazis also took Jews away to work in Krakow factories. Some of the truckloads of Jews never came back, but nobody knew what happened to them. My parents didn't want to take any chances one way or another, so I had, I had to stay in the building, in our building at all times. I took my ball into the hallway outside our apartment and practiced kicking it against the wall until a mean old Miss Emmerglick across the hall came out and yelled at me to stop. I was just about to go downstairs to the basement to play when I heard a scream from one of the lower floors, then footsteps, lots of footsteps, a door smashing, more screams. I ran back inside our flat. Mama, Mama, I called to my mother. Something is happening in the building. Everyone staying in our apartment came together in the sitting room. We listened as the screams and crashes grew closer. I felt sick. I wished my father were there with us, and but he had gone out to stand in line for our vegetable rations. Someone pounded on the door. We all jumped. Open up on the authority of the Judenrat. Everyone looked to my mother. It was our flat after all but she just watched the door with big, round eyes. My heart was racing. What should we do? What could we do? Mama, I said. <laughs> Open up the door, we'll break it down, said another voice, this time in German, a Nazi. Mama, I said, if we don't open the door, they'll shoot us. My mother stared at the door. None of the other parents made a move. I had to do something. I hurried to the door and unlocked it, and a German officer and a Judenrat police officer pushed past me down the hall. The Judenrat were the Jews the Nazis put in charge of the ghetto, and they had special police officers who had to take orders from the Nazis. When we tell you to open the door, open the door, the German officer told the adults. The families held up together, hugging another tight. Do you have jewels? Gold? A radio? He demanded. My mother didn't answer. She just stared at the Nazi and trembled. He was getting madder. I could tell. The officer took a step toward my mother, and I spoke up. In the kitchen, I said. The German turned to look at me with his cold blue eyes and then nodded to the Jewish policeman, who, car who carried a snack, a sack. You're valuables, the officer said. Now, or you'll all be taken away. Someone screamed across the hall. Old Mrs. Emmerglick and her family were being dragged away by the German soldiers. Her son, a man my father's age, had blood running down his forehead. Give it to them, I yelled. Give them anything they want. The other families in our flat scrambled to give the Nazi officer everything they had squirreled away. Little bits of jewelry, a pocket watch, a handful of zloty, with the number of Judenrat, the number of Judenrat came out of our kitchen with his sack stuffed with more than just our radio and went into the bedrooms looking up for anything more of value. The German officer pulled the necklace from my mother's neck and twisted her wedding ring from her finger. She flinched when he did it, but she didn't say a word. This flat can stay, the German officer said, pocketing my mother's jewelry. But next time, open the door more quickly or we'll send you to the east with the rest. Yes, sir, we will, sir, I said. The two men left, and we all stood frozen, listening to, to the shouts and sobs above us and below us. Out on the streets, two big gray military trucks pulled up, and Jews from our apartment building and all the buildings around us were herded into them by German soldiers. They carried nothing with them. No suitcases, no extra clothes, no food, no personal belongings. Wherever they were going, they would have to do without. 
Something clattered in the hall outside. The doors to our flat and the Amerglick's apartment were still open. I could see an overturned table and lamp in their flat, but nothing more. Why had the Amerglick's and the families living with them been taken, and we had it? The officer said it was because we gave them our valuable, valuables, but the Amerglick's had a radio and jewelry and Zlotty just like us. The Germans had taken the Amerglick's for no more reason than they felt like it. A shot rang out into the street, and we all jumped again. Panic, Miss Rosenblum whispered. The door. I glanced at my mother, but she was a million miles away, and her eyes were focused on the rug at our feet, her face empty of emotion. I don't know if she had even heard the shot. I tiptoed down the entrance hall and closed the door, flipping the lock with a click. It didn't make me feel any safer. When the trucks in the street were full, they pulled away. We never heard where they went. My father could have been on one of them for all I knew. My mother sat at the table, her mind still elsewhere. At this time of day, she would usually be in the kitchen preparing whatever rations we had for lunch. But that was no use now. Our cupboards had been cleared out in the raid. We had nothing to eat. The other families retreated to their rooms to see what had been taken and what was left. The Rose Rosenblum girls wailed like they were trying to outdo each other in volume, so I slipped out into the hall. The door to the Emmerglick's flat was still open, and someone was inside. It was Mr. Tarka, from down the hall. When he'd heard the click of the door behind me, he whirled. One of the Emmerglick's nice cushioned seating room chairs was in his hands. He opened his mouth to say something, got flustered, then hurried past me. He took the chair with him. I walked out. I walked the hallway to on my floor, looking at the empty rooms. Four flats, sixteen families, all gone. Only two had their doors shut, us and the Tarkas. Five flats were empty on the floor above us, but only three on the top floor. Maybe the Germans got tired of walking up all those steps. We, I went back to the stairs and realized for the first time there was another set of stairs going up, even though this was the top floor. I'd never had any friends on the top floor, so I'd only gone up once or twice in the, in the past to run an errand. I started down the stairwell, but listening for a new invasion of Germans. But everything was quiet and still. I climbed the extra flight of stairs. There was a big steel door at the top. I opened it a crack and looked outside. The roof! The door led out onto the roof! How had I not known this was here? But then, even if I had known, my parents would have never let me come up here. Not in the past, when things like bedtimes and homework and safe places to play had been important. None of that mattered now. And I pushed my way outside and stood on the roof of our building. It was flat and covered with gravel. Pipes and con conduits stuck up out of the roof here and there. The roof's edges, a little more than half a meter all the way around, were plastered with black tar. Strangest of all was a small wooden shack built up against a big brick chimney. It had a thin wooden door, and when I went inside, I found heaps of garbage and feathers and bird droppings. A pigeon coop! Mr. Emglick's pigeon coop, probably. When I was a little boy, I knew all about the old man who lived across the hall and that he loved pig pigeons, but I never imagined he kept a coop on the roof. The pigeons were all gone now, just like the Emmerglick, just like Mr. Emmerglick. He died a year before the Nazis came. But this shack on the roof? If it was repaired a little, cleaned up, maybe had some electricity running to it from the power lines that came into the building from the roof, my mind was racing. I ran back downstairs as first, fast as I could and burst into my flat. Mama! I cried. I, I found my mother in the kitchen, hugging my father. He was alive! He broke away from her when I came running in. What is it, Yannick? He asked. Are they coming back? No, no, I want to show you something. I found. Come quick. My parents followed me up the stairs, walking when I wanted them to run. Finally, when I pulled them out onto the roof and showed them the pigeon coop. Don't you see? With a little work, we could live here. Leave our flat? Father asked. Just the three of us, I told them. It's so crowded downstairs. Here, we have a place all to ourselves. We can scrub the floor and the walls and clean it up. 
and I can wire up a light from my projector and a hot plate for cooking on. There's no bathroom, but we could always go back downstairs for that. And in the winter, we have the chimney to keep us warm. I don't know, Yannick, my father said. My mother hadn't come inside the coop. Instead, she just stood outside, staring back at the big steel door that opened onto the roof. We can bring up chairs, I told my father, and a mattress and bars, my mother said. It was the first thing I'd heard her say since the Nazis burst into our flat. Can you put bars on the door? She stared at it, but I could tell her thoughts were still downstairs, reliving the invasion of our home. My father came out of the coop and put his arm around mother's shoulders. Yes, Mina, we'll fix up the coop and live here, and we'll put bars on the door. Yannick and I will see to it. We gave our flat to the Rosenblums. The Brotmans were already moving into the Emmerglicks apartment across the hall. All the empty flats in our building would soon be overflowing with families as more Jews were marched in through the gates. But for a short time at least, we would all live like normal people again. While my father and I worked to clean the coop, my mother and I sat on the roof and sewed hidden pockets into the lining of our coats. Inside them, she hid all the money and valuables we had left. We never said another word, though, all that day. Father and I found four heavy steel bars in the basement. By sundown, we lifted the last of them onto the door to the roof. They slid into place so we can take them off to go out, but, that so, but so that no one from the inside the stairs could push through. There, I told my mother, no one will be able to break in ever again.